So welcome to the next episode of the Paving the Way Home podcast. And we're delighted to be uh, to be in a completely new surroundings this week. Thanks a million to the uh, Irish Dominicans here in St. Mary's and Pope's Key in Cork, and in particular Father Luke Janssen for uh, for inviting us in to, to use uh, his equipment and his and uh, and the studio. It's fantastic. And this week we're delighted to be joined by Father Vincent Stapleton from the Archdiocese of Cashel and Emily. Father Vincent, you're you're very welcome. Thanks a million, Brian. I'm delighted to be here. It's a first for me now. So excellent. No, it's brilliant. It's brilliant to have you. And look, before we get started uh, in the talk, could I ask you to begin with a prayer? Absolutely. So we place ourselves now under the sign of the cross in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. We lift up our hearts and minds to you, Heavenly Father. Uh, your eyes are always upon us, always uh, watching over us with fatherly care. So we entrust ourselves to, to you and to everybody, everybody as well uh, who, who, who will listen to us. We ask you, Lord, to bless our, our hearts and minds with rays of your light and love and uh, to, to guide us, to guide us in the way of your Son, Jesus Christ, and uh, to pour out his spirit of love upon us. And so we ask this prayer in the name of Jesus, the Lord, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thanks a million for our wedding. Um, so I, I, I always begin this with um, the same way with, with new priests, but particularly when there's a when there's a young priest on, you're, you're, you're ordained only a few years. And I suppose when you look at Ireland today, look at the priests of today, younger priests are probably few and far between. So um, like I know you were a teacher beforehand and a, uh, a keen herder in, in, in Tipperary and that, but what made you become a priest? So yeah, it, there's, there's a, a very long version and uh, th- I'm going to pick the shorter version <laughs> today, but luckily enough for me, I grew up in a, in a family of faith and uh, mom and dad were good old fashioned uh, rosary Catholics and we had rosary every evening in our house. So, so I grew up in that and um, supposing my teens drifted away a bit as, as, as everybody does and began to question and felt it was a bit stale or something like that. And it was then when I ended up in the classroom uh, in my uh, early 20s uh, and maybe I hadn't put so much into the, into the college preparation, the couple of years I spent training as a teacher. So that was a bit hit and miss. And I struggled in the first couple of years to, to find my feet in the classroom with, with the different strains and pressures of that. And I found myself turning back to prayer in that time. Uh, and it became much more living for me. And, and God uh, was, was a, a kind of an encouragement and a, a sense of energy uh, that, that I got from my prayer, as well as that then uh, chatting with the children in school and, and teaching religion. And I, I don't know uh, if other teachers have experienced this, but I've always felt that, that uh, younger children have tremendous questions and questions about why, as we know, and you know, Brian, from having, having uh, small children, why is this the way it is? Why, why, why? <laughs> and, and they asked fantastic questions in the religion that left me scratching my head uh, because we had our, our program, the, the Alive O program, as it was at the time, with the stories from the Bible and stories about Jesus. And they said, why did he do this? And uh, I'd be above at the top of the class kind of saying, uh, go home and, and uh, do a bit of research. And then I'd go home myself and research. And so I got, I developed the interest and began to understand the, the, the theology behind it and the philosophy and got a, got a liking for that as well. And it, one thing led to another. And uh, before I, I knew it, I suppose I was, I was in over my head in, in, uh, in uh, religious matters and in just a pure uh, interest in it. And nothing gave me more joy, I think, than to, than to teach the religion. And my vocation, which was there as a child, which uh, had maybe been planted early in, in the family of my, of my parents in, in my, my home house, um, that came back with a, I won't say with a vengeance, but it came back very strongly. And, and uh, so it took me a long time, though, to, to make the decision to break with, with the comfortable life I knew teaching and, and at home and to enter the seminary. But I've had a great peace ever since. Now, it hasn't been a perfect straight road. It has been a narrow uphill mm. uh, one at times. Uh, but, but that uh, underlying peace has always been there. And the, the sense of reward and sense of, of a good fit um, is always with me. And I thank God for that. That's fantastic. As you're talking there, one thing that strikes me is uh, you're, you're talking about how it was, you know, the children ask you the question, the why, why, why? Uh, and it's almost as if that was the, the trigger to start, um, you know, delving into the faith, delving into, uh, you know, looking at different questions. Because what it reminds me of my eldest daughter, Jessica, when she was a, uh, a couple of months old, 
Uh, I remember when whenever we were getting her to bed at night, she she'd never go straight into the cot. You had to she had to sleep uh, fall asleep on our bed, and we lift her in. But remember one night I was putting her to sleep. She was lying on the bed, and I was lying next to her, and it was complete silence. And uh, and she was just looking at me. And next thing she started, uh, she just very slowly started putting her hand up to my face and just started exploring my eyes, my nose, my mouth, and. It, something struck me at that moment it was like it taught me about prayer and our, our relationship with God I was like you know so many times I was thinking of you know when when, when you go to church when you go to prayer you always it's always me going talking talk, talk. I'm not even giving God a, a chance the next thing I was like well actually there was so much happening in the silence and I learned so much from that moment from her about prayer uh, and I was just so when you were talking there about uh, the kids it was the kids asking why why and that began, made you uh you know delve further into exploring the faith it's uh it's amazing how the how, how the innocent how innocent children are and yet they can have such a major effect on us and during your time growing up in um uh in tipperary then you um you you you're an avid hurler that's right um, so i i literally only just hung up my my boots a couple of weeks ago so uh with the whole COVID situation the championship didn't progress as as planned and um, I struggle to get out to train and at times as well. So I'm not always uh, uh, top of the pile when it, when it comes to attendance and, and stuff like that because my, my parish duties are, are demanding and they're not regular. But, um, but I loved it and I've loved it ever since I was six or seven years of age because I grew up not too far from Turles, the, the I suppose the place where the GA was, was founded and our village is stone mad on Hurlan. And, uh, but, uh, so this last year now I'm 38 and the bones are creaking and the joints are are knocking and so the last two games I was playing junior this year and uh, the second last game I got a, a concussion and the physio came in and she asked me uh, what year was it and I couldn't think of what year it was and then I met a guy going off the field and he was like he, he was hurling when I was he was in, in his 30s hurling against us when I was 18 he said uh, what age are you now and I couldn't think of my age and then the following week I gave my ankle a very bad twist and it swelled up like it, like it was like a golf ball on the side of the ankle. And I said, OK, that's it. Uh, it's time to time yeah. to quit. And I, I can't even say quit while you're ahead because I was ahead about 10 years ago. But um, I was really enjoying it. And that's yeah. the but um, but I, I'm I'm cer- I'm definitely uh, I actually had to have my the laces cut off my boot to remove it from the from yeah. the sprain. So I said, that's it. I'm not buying a new set of laces. I'm just going to let it go <laughs> and uh, find another. I have to find another lace. Um, I suppose less uh, stressful way of exercising now, because uh, I, I have to mind have to mind these joints and and muscles and ligaments, yeah. and they're they're all very frail. I didn't really mind them back along. Yeah. I throw myself into whatever tackle, or yeah. and uh, it, it comes back to you then. Fair play. And, so, but and I, if you don't mind me asking, when you were when, when you were beginning to uh, enter the priesthood, uh, even discerning, or uh, you made a decision into seminary. First of all, that was. Well, you were part of the year for vocations what wasn't it it was the, it, you the, in particular in ireland in the year of vocations there was a huge number compared to other years entered may and it was the same here in the dominicans and you were part of that bunch weren't you that's correct yeah, yeah. so we started on the 23rd of august 2009 i think there was 31 started and um 16 i think were ordained out of our group um so and there was a big uptake in the Dominicans and as you say the year before was a year of consecrated prayer or concentrated prayer for for vocation so it, it bore fruit in that year and we were very lucky the caliber of fellas who came in in that 31 were were extraordinary and it, it made such a difference to our formation then we bonded really early we we had a wonderful class and I just had a phone call before coming coming into you here from one of the guys and he's he's hoping to call down next week when, when he's a day off. So like we've struggled to keep in touch because we're all of course. hectic, but yeah. but we, we do manage it from time to time. So And when you decided to you made that decision, you were going to uh you were going to enter seminary, give your life to become a priest, what was the reaction around the dressing room and, and that? So I have to say I, I was quite worried about what the reaction would be and I felt and even messages came back to me not from friends of mine but from others who, who felt uh, that I was wasting my life or throwing it away and I thought that I was going to either get that kind of reaction or a, a type of ridicule uh, so I didn't tell very many people in fact I only told the couple of priests that were involved in the in the discernment process and my parents early on and uh, my parents kind of had to say to me as as the entry day to Maynooth was approaching, 
what about your your three brothers are you going to tell them yeah. and none of them would be uh, gospel greedy even though i think they all have a healthy respect for for the faith and and have have their own faith um so i i, I found it very difficult to tell them yeah. and uh, ours is is a kind of a sport and rough and tumble family and it's not a um yeah. you know an emotionally um <laughs> expressive one yeah. so so i told them and i got shrugs of the shoulders but i think deep down they were they were um happy for me and and uh and uh and i got i got i've always got support from them then and then telling my friends so that was that was uh quite difficult and i left it until almost the last weekend really yeah. now which is i mean that was that was a uh, cowardly uh yeah. f- from my book so i was manager of the boris lee under 14s at the time and yeah. we'd reached an art final and we were beaten in the North final um, on on uh, maybe the Friday or Saturday. And I had a couple of the friends who were with me after and say, I'm actually heading off tomorrow to seminary. And it was almost like a mic drop in yeah. um, in uh, some comic studio. And they're like, "You what? Uh, and uh, so I told no one of the, of the hurlers, just a couple of closer friends. And when I went up, I was convinced that's it. That chapter of my life is closed. And I went into the vocations director the, the first couple of weeks for the meeting. And I said, look, I had the, these hobbies. I lo- love hurling. I'm kind of finished with all that now. And he said, you're not finished with any of that stuff because it keeps you co- contacted with your friends and grounded. And Fantastic. you stay playing your sport and you, we let you go. So three weeks later, I found myself back down for an North Tipperary Championship game against La- Laura at the time. And their manager was well-renowned because he, he, uh, he had... Um, Won two All Irelands for Tipperary. Ken Hogan was his name, oh, yeah. and uh, Ken, fantastic fellow. But he came into the dressing room afterwards to congratulate us. We won, and he said, "I hear one of you has has um, gone forward to the seminary, and it's extraordinary in this day and age." And just want to congratulate you, him and the club and everybody. And our lads had a big kind of roar, and I was like, "This is not what I was expecting at all." <laughs> so, I mean, it was fantastic, and and uh, I mean, they'll they'll give me a lot of slagging and stuff, but like by and large, they're 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 behind me. All the way, so that's fantastic. And you, you talk about uh, uh, it being cowardly. You leaving it for three weeks beforehand. I'll, I'll go even better than that because, like you and I, spent a, a year together in seminary. Um, I spent my first year in Maynooth and then the the other few in Rome. But during as the first Sunday, as I was driving into Maynooth, we arrived in the town of Maynooth. We were approaching the seminary, and as we were about to go through the gates, my it was my parents were with me. I didn't send a text to my friends to say because all of, it was as we were put in, shut off the phone because we were going to have to have the phones off for a month. And I was like, you know, and that was, it was literally on the 11th hour I sent it to them. And, you know, some reactions were good. Others were a bit unusual. But, you know, after time, it it, it, it all worked out. But, uh, yeah, so when, don't be too hard on yourself. When you call yourself <laughs> cowardly, it was, that was, uh, that was heroic compared to the way I did it. But uh, fair play to you. That's fantastic. So today, today we're going talking about um, a, about a topic that's very um, that's very important to you recently, in particular, uh, as you were saying, and that's the transcendence of God. Now, for people who, you know, who, who wouldn't be that up in their theology, what does even that mean? Okay, so yeah, it's difficult, uh, difficult uh, idea, transcendence. And so maybe if we start with like a Johnny Depp film, yeah. okay, from a couple of years ago, uh, Johnny Depp had a film, the title of it was Transcendence. And um, from what I, I have never watched the film, but uh, what I get from the plot is that uh, he was a bit of a computer genius and there was artificial intelligence and he wanted to upload his his consciousness onto a computer and all the drama then uh, takes off out of that. But it's this... Um, I suppose uh, ability to to improve on your nature or to go a step beyond uh, that that is I suppose what what uh, sums up the meaning of transcendence for me and I kind of looked uh, at a definition it's like we have our limits and to surpass or exceed your limits is is to to transcend where you've been at and uh, to be to be that bit uh, superior um, and then I suppose it's to break out of the bounds that that hold us. You talk about the comfort zone or something like mm. that. You want to transcend that by pushing out into more difficult um, situations. So that's like a basic understanding of transcendence. Okay. But uh, in in uh, theology or in our faith, we're talking about the transcendence of God, uh, which means that uh, God is greater than. Uh, all the bounds of the created world and uh, so if if we're to try and bound our our the, the creation the universe we kind of uh, bind it in space and time mm. and so when i say uh, god is transcendent it means that that he's he's greater than that and um 
I think I have to be careful because you might say he, he's outside of space and time, but transcendence, like a lot of Catholic uh, ideas, has a is one of a pair. Okay. And so, like I'm putting the emphasis maybe today on transcendence, but if I don't mention the pair, I'm 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 uh, given a skewed uh, vision. Okay. So like we have uh, this both and theology. So yes. you have faith and reason. Yes. And you have faith and works. And you have uh, uh, theology and philosophy, and there's so many other both yeah. ends yeah. that are, and, and and the pair here are transcendence. God is both transcendent; that's it. He's greater than the entire mm. creation, but he's also imminent. Yeah. And the two can't be separated or broken up. So even if I'm doing a lot of talking about transcendence here, uh, it it really needs to be balanced with with a sense of God's imminence. Which means God, like, and when we were in primary school, you learned this thing: where is God? God is everywhere, yeah. and He's here with us, but uh, in in a way that transcends our ability to understand. Yeah. So that's like a basic introduction. Yeah. And um, so, so basic, we're talking about, you know, it, 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 in some ways, it's like, you know, we we can't necessarily put God into uh, into a box because He's not. He, 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 even though he he operates outside space and time, he's within space and time. He's not confined to space and time. That kind of thing. It just and correct me here if I'm wrong. I remember a story uh, years ago uh, about Padre Pio, and Padre Pio was um, it was towards the end of his life from what I can remember, and he was praying for a happy death for his grandfather who had died fifty years beforehand. And the people were like, "Well, what are you doing?" Because and he says, "God is not." Uh, you know, God is not bound by space and time. The the prayers that I pray now, um, and that God was is able to use those for uh, for my grandfather. Uh, is that the kind of, kind of thing we're talking about? Well, that's that's a, an aspect of yeah, it, yeah. yeah. And uh, it's something similar actually with the Immaculate Conception. Okay. Uh, that the, the like we can say of Mary, even though you know be, uh, at the moment of her conception, Mary is conceived immaculately and uh, by a singular grace of God. Uh, no stain of sin, uh, either original or actual, ha- has has ever clung to her, and yeah. um, uh, we're we're scratching our heads. So then, all those years later, Jesus dies on the cross. Did that not affect Mary? Mm. And uh, the the explanation is that God applied the the merits of Jesus's passion to Mary uh, from all eternity, so outside of space and time. So even though the passion came later in time, uh, God was able to apply. Uh, in in eternity to Mary the 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 merits of that so Mary too uh, is is one of those who's saved by Jesus but in a, in a unique and singular way uh, oh. such that uh, from the moment of her conception she's protected by the by the grace of the Lord's cross from from any contact with sin which is extraordinary mm-hmm. and it's the same idea yeah and and so that's definitely um, that's a, an important element of of what we say when we mean God is transcendent and not bound. Yeah, and it, it's amazing because for for us, uh, for us Catholics, for human beings in general, it's 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 so it's quite difficult and tricky to get our mind about because our lives, everything from the chairs we're sitting on, the table here, everything had a had a beginning, it has its lifetime, and everything will 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 have an end. We'll all have an end. Uh, like even these past few seconds as I'm speaking, I can never go back to them again. So any everything we know. Uh, you know, it, it operates according to that. So then to be speaking to get our minds about, I guess this is all part of the mystery of God as well, to, to, to almost to come outside of that is 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 uh, is, is mind walking really. Yeah. 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 And, and and it's it's really important because uh, we're hoping to, to relate to God and to form a relationship with him. And as you say, if you put God in a box or um confine him in some in some case like it's not an authentic relationship then it's like if we're relating and i just want to see you as maybe uh the podcast guy yeah. and 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 not see you in your fullness yeah. uh or or somebody just wants to come up to me and say you're the hurling priest and oh so i have no other interests or anything so if we kind of cage god in in certain ways and um and get the get the image of god wrong uh, it can really affect our ability to connect with him. Yeah. And uh, a story from from uh, Bishop Barron. Well, Bishop. So it's a, uh, he's relating another story. He said that the so one of the cosmonauts, maybe it was Yuri Gagarin, uh, uh, from the Soviet space program, managed to be managed to get into space. And one of the kind of propaganda elements that came out of it was he's like, uh, we're up here in space now, and we're looking around, and we don't see any sign of God. Yeah. Uh, and like I say, some people would be saying, well, I thought God was like a bearded 
uh, benevolent old man on a cloud who looks yeah. down and maybe throws the odd thunderbolt. Yeah. So when we get above in our airplane, why don't we see him down there? But um, like from a Catholic perspective, we never expect to see God. Uh, once you have a, a, a wholesome understanding yeah. of 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 uh, who God is, you wouldn't expect to see him on a cloud as a, a limited individual who only yeah. takes up so much space. Yeah. Because like, uh, and somewhere in the scriptures it says God is spirit. Yeah. And um and so that that that's part of the understanding anyway. And Father John Harris here of the Dominicans, I think it was at the U two thousand online summer festival. He 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 in his own inimitable way he said, you know, God is not us, uh, writ large. Are just multiplied. He's not yeah. some bigger and better version of yeah. me. That's 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 up there somewhere. And I think we often do that. Yeah. And and uh, it's a it's a skewed image of God. Yeah. And maybe then another skewed image of God is that that we tend to attribute to him maybe the attributes of those who were authority figures when we were younger. Yeah. So primarily maybe our parents. So you're thinking of my dad, who who's like the authority figure in our house, or the principal mm-hmm. in the primary school, and that we get this idea then that God is like that. And so I suppose why I really love this idea of God's transcendence is that, um, and you mentioned the word earlier on, it's a key word is mystery, mm. that there is th- this mystery that we call God uh, is, is out there. And it, the idea, the transcendent idea of this mystery is captivating me, to be honest. Mm. Uh, and then the idea that this mystery, which is so much greater than the entire created universe, also wants to to kind of engage. Mm. Uh, he wants to engage with everyone, but with each of us individually as well. And um, it's a bit like um, me deciding, okay, I just love that tiny little ant down there and yeah. I want to engage in a friendship and a relationship yeah. with him. And so from our perspective, that's crazy. Like yeah. uh, you could, yeah. I mean, so you'd have to say that there was something wrong with me if I was having a relationship with the ant, but that's the way God looks at, looks down at us. And we are no more than that, more than a grain of sand under his feet. And, uh, and still he wants that relationship. So it's, it's pretty extraordinary. Like Yeah, and I, I guess like you, as you're talking there, um, when you think of, when you think of, uh, you know, the fall of, of Lucifer from heaven, I guess it was, it was all, I suppose, um, around that kind of a, a thing. And so far as human beings were almost like the, the lowest, the low angels were higher. And the idea of, the idea of this human being becoming a mother of God and then the idea of God taking on the form of a human being was so beneath that couldn't even, you know, could, couldn't even, um, you couldn't accept that. And and yet, like for us as human beings, sometimes we can fall into the trap that like we are the whole world. And there was something else you, you mentioned there while ago and it was very interesting how about, you know, <clears throat> we can make the identity of God uh, a certain part of him without taking in the, the whole thing. And it just reminds me of, we were recording a podcast last night with Father Philip Kemi and from the Archdiocese of Rocco and we were just talking about our identity as children of God. And you know, we kind of made the point that, you know, in today's society, you know, our identity sometimes can ha- has become based on maybe our sexual orientation or gender uh, or color of our skin or race, whatever, where in fact, our 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 identity is that we're all children of God. That's our primary identity, and everything comes from that. So it, it, it just very interesting as I'm listening to you there. The way it's even challenging me is that, you know, even in my prayer, my relationship with God, how how even subconsciously I can I I can at times maybe put him into these cat into a category into a kind of a box, almost as if I'm trying to control them, whereas. God is just out there and, 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 you know, and it just shows us as well why, you know, it's God who's to lead us in prayer instead of us trying to tell God and, and, uh, and force God into a situation. And uh, I know now I'm going off in a little tangent here, but just as you were, as, as you were speaking there, these are the things that are coming into mind. So it, it's fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And um, so people have heard of Anselm's ontological yeah. argument yeah, okay answer, and it's yeah. it's one that can just make you cross-eyed and yeah. you, you'll kind of go to sleep with a pain in your head trying to think about it but what he actually said about god was i think one of the maybe the first line in the argument was uh god is that greater than which cannot be conceived or thought and uh he said even a fool can kind of understand so he was being a bit i don't know whatever facetious or yeah. he said even a fool can understand that that's what we mean by god yeah. that greater than which yeah. cannot be conceived and um so, so a, a guy came back then uh another monk uh Gaunilo, and he said uh but sure i can talk about uh 
a, a wonderful island out in the Pacific Ocean, out in the Pacific Ocean, uh, an island greater than which has never been conceived with all the beauties that an island has to have. Uh, and uh, you say this island has to exist, and I'm saying that's a, that's a bit nonsense. So, like the the issue with with uh, Anselm's argument is whether this great being greater than which anything uh, cannot be conceived, wh- whether this actually exists or not, is 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 um is that issue. But so like um you have the likes of Gaunil and he's talking about again he reduces it to something physical like the island or you have uh, the benevolent man on the cloud or some people who want to make fun of of Christian believers are talking like about a unicorn or do we believe in a unicorn or uh, the flying spaghetti monsters, the one that often mm. goes around on the internet as a kind of a, I don't know, a, a, maybe slightly a mockery. But uh, but it, it is important to, to, to emphasize when we're talking about God's transcendence that uh, that all these narrow categories are labels that, that you're talking about, which, which, see, which really reduce uh, our experience of reality are not appropriate here. And um, so... Uh, the, wh- wh- where I got into this, maybe, is it was through a book that I've been trying to read. Okay. Right? An extraordinarily difficult book. Okay. And um, so I apologize to, the, to the, the Reverend Father who wrote it, who's in heaven now, a man called Eric Schwara. And uh, he wrote a book called The Analogy of Being. Okay. Okay. Right. It's a really extraordinary book. And he was a contemporary of Edith Stein. And the two of them were writing on pretty much the same thing, uh, which is analogy and uh, how we use language or how we mm. use words. Okay, and um, so if I say, I'm just trying to say um, a word like uh, delicious, and I say that ice cream is delicious, and you say uh, that that uh, Mars bear is delicious, we're using the same word in the same way. Whereas um, if I say that uh, um, that table is bare, uh, and you say that bear is going to attack you. Yeah. So it's 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 a similar it's it's the same word used in completely yes. different same yeah. sound yeah. and and uh, so one is the exact same meaning used and we call that univocal okay. right and then the other one is equivocal it's like using the same word for completely different meanings but analogy is slightly different it's where there's an overlap of meaning yes. but it's not exact okay okay, okay. so um, and I think like even going back to Aristotle and Aquinas they talk about the the word health being used of a doctor of a medicine and of a patient. And uh, so the the but health means three different things, but they're all kind. There's kind of an overlap. Now, when we're when we're talking about God, because this is heavy stuff, and as I say, the book is the book is extraordinary. I've been the whole lockdown trying to get through yeah. it, and I still have about <laughs> four hundred pages, and yeah. it's it's like eating I don't know the, the, the <laughs> highest fiber content in theology. But um, so he's he's talking about like how we use words about about God and about ourselves. So we call God Father. And I call my own father at home father. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's not that they're two totally different meanings, but like the understanding of father I have comes from this earthly reality. Of course, yeah. Right? But God as a father is something uh, completely above and beyond that. But there's still a link between um, what I mean when I say this is my father here yeah. and then I pray to my heavenly father. Yeah. They're not unconnected or, okay. or divorced from each other. Um, and uh, there, there are so many other words. We say God is good. And then we say, well, Brian is good because uh, he Brian is good because he he helps the poor and he's he's kind to everybody in his family and he likes to to um, I suppose uh, get involved in in the community train and team. So Brian is good. And then we say God is good and uh, like your goodness is qualified in all sorts of different ways. Mm. But the goodness of God is pure and whole and, yeah. and unqualified. And um, uh, so. Uh, the, the idea of analogy, and I'm going to going to make a quotation here yeah. now. So this is from, and, and this is what uh, the priest, Father Eric Schwerer, uh, based his book on. So it's a quotation from the Fourth Lateran Council, 12, okay. 1215 okay. Uh, AD, right? And, he, and the line is simple. It says, between the creature and the creator, no similitude or likeness or comparison can be expressed. So to say that, that we're like God in any way, without implying at the same time an ever greater dissimilitude or an ever greater unlikeness. So in all the language that we use about God or how we understand him, he says this principle must be operative across the board okay. to, to, to preserve God's transcendence. So it's not that we ever control God or that we can describe how he is. He remains always a mystery before mm, us. Mm. And maybe to sum it up in much, uh, a much uh, more simple and beautiful way, Augustine uh, 
uh, talking about God, he said, if you understand, it's not him. Yeah. Right. If you can, yeah. um, I suppose, circumvent him or cage him in, in your categories. Well, what yeah. you've got inside then is no longer God. OK, so uh, and, and again, so like a key uh, concept for us is mystery. Yeah. Um, the idea that okay, God is 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 so far above and beyond us that we're struggling to to even get a foothold, mm. right? And so I, I suppose maybe scratching your head now, and if for for anyone who's listening, they're saying okay, so he's a bit like a a helium balloon that's drifting off into the atmosphere away from us, and we can't mm. we can't uh, get at it, or, or mm. how can we ever get our our you know establish yeah. this relationship yeah. with God? Yeah, and that that's me because as you're as you're talking there. Um, like particularly particularly in today's world where we live in a very uh scientific world so when we talk about the mystery of god and struggling to get a foot a foothold you know, we're living in a society maybe that you know very much uh uh i suppose that you know maybe embodies you know science rationalism everything you can understand like as you're talking there because i i can understand why people People want to know, no, you have to tell me now exactly what God is, who God is, define him and everything. So when you say, mm, well, God is, you know, as as St. Augustine had said, uh, if you think you're getting to understand God, well, that's not God. Uh, and, and that. So it, it's, in, it's interesting how you can, I can understand why people will, will, will fob that off and say, oh, sure, your God is is whatever in paving the way home and if you're if you're on our facebook uh page uh anytime you, you'll see all these comments coming in from people but it's uh it's interesting i mean in so far as in in terms of our relationship with this god who is a complete mystery and we're struggling to get a foothold what's striking me there is like there is there is this kind of uh on our part this requirement of a uh and again i know i'm going slightly off topic here but there is this this requirement of a complete surrender to that you know what i i'm never going to fully comprehend god in this life but just 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 do but just to give everything over anyway and do my best to to to, i I suppose i'm as i'm talking i'm thinking of a conversation just very recently as well with a uh with a with a friend of ours who um is is has done very well in in the medical field uh, consultant in, in another country but really trying to struggle and grasp this idea of God and because for example he's coming across illnesses viruses all these things every day and they're able to break them down and say this is exactly what it does this 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 so this is what it means and this and if you want to cure it this is what you have to do so when you're just trying to bring that uh, mentality to God and to define God and get a grasp in God there's there's this frustration coming out and um and uh, and sorry that, that that's just striking me there as you're t- as you're talking yeah so like i hear what you're saying and um i've struggled with that myself actually and sure uh what believer hasn't struggled yeah. with um with the i suppose the findings of science and and uh, the whole scientific mentality now one of my other great mentors is an italian priest who who died in 2005 father luigi giussani okay. and he talks about um human reason right okay. our rational ability to engage with the world on many different levels and uh the wonders of, of scientific reason he says scientific reason isn't the totality of human reason okay. it's not the it's not the only mode we have for engaging with the world the measuring and the the an- analysis and the and and um the discoveries that come through science there's many other different types of reason there's uh, akin to sci- scientific reason is mathematical reason but there, there's many others like there's the reasons of the heart that yeah. pascal would talk about um uh, by by which we we engage in in the world of love uh, which is i mean cannot be measured yeah. by scientific standards and it is is part of and i suppose this is one of the things that, that uh, as as the scientific methods became more defined and you had uh, the movements such as logical positivism which mm. trying to be really uh, to verify all sorts of truths through through the scientific method well things that were getting squeezed out were things like love and yeah. uh, human freedom even yeah. because there's so much you can map neurologically but uh, you still have to kind of sit back and marvel at the mystery of human freedom yeah. and then love and trying to get a handle on that I mean it totally or, or for, for a believer for somebody who believes in the human soul 
uh, it, it it doesn't feature uh, in these so so are those all to be thrown out as irrational mm. because they don't meet the scientific mm. um uh, measurements yeah. and I don't think so because yeah. I mean such so much of the richness of life is just tossed out with it yeah. uh, and and we're able to engage in all that richness like we're able yeah. to we're able to relate to beauty and create it yeah. we're able to engage in relationships and and make a hames of them or build them yeah. up again and that's a whole different type yeah. of of uh, of um, of ratio or reason yeah. so for anyone that's listening and you know this is this this has been fascinating but anyone's listening, and maybe even people that are on the fringes of the faith, and they're 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 hearing, they're listening to us discuss uh, today about like about this this transcendent God, this God of mystery, this God that is, you know, that we can't even comprehend. And you know, for maybe people starting out, the thought of that is maybe even be a little bit daunting. But yet, we're all called. The whole purpose of our being here on Earth is to uh, enter into a relationship with God. So what would you what would you say what would you recommend how would you even begin a relationship uh with uh with this god that is just out there Yeah okay so uh that's a very good very good uh question and a huge one Yeah <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm putting on the spot here <laughs> No pressure whatsoever but okay so we'll take two avenues right yeah. So so say there is this um extraordinary being which transcends the entire created world and um you, you're wondering okay how do how do i get in touch or and so you just maybe go down the one road first and that's right uh it's it's almost like the entire universe then uh, bears his fingerprints or mm. uh, say like you have the building and you're wondering at least is there an architect and you you kind mm. of follow up uh you using our own intelligence to 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 answer that question and like for the ancient philosophers the first ones who really uh, pursued wisdom with with um i suppose a, a great drive the thing that struck them was was and aristotle was the one who said it was wonder at, at just this whole created world and and um father Jusani, who i mentioned earlier on he had this thing of just to imagine for yourself now we go through like the humdrum of life and you get up in the morning you're out and you're on the street and you're you're at your work it's, it's, it's almost like imagine you were you you were just created now and opened your eyes for the first time and you're kind of struck by the wonder of everything mm. and and uh you're, you're you're amazed by the greens and you're amazed by the blue of the sky and yeah. by the person you're interacting with and and that sense of wonder and it's only natural to begin to question well where does it all come from yeah. and uh, so that's one path yeah. uh because uh I suppose in in a Catholic philosophy we describe all the beings that that are contained within the universe as contingent None yeah. of them actually contains within themselves the the reason or origin of their own existence. Mm. That they, they all are traced; they're all dependent on something else uh, to bring them into being, and also dependent on on something else to draw the the, the fullness of their existence out of them. Mm. Uh, and so you can trace your way back there and say, well, is there anything standing under all of these? Is there anything drawing the good out of all of them? Mm. Uh, because why why is why why is that movement there? Why is the dynamism in in mm. each created thing? Yeah. And this desire for good, the fact that we are inspired by mm. by heroism and moved to tears by by beauty and stuff like that. I mean, is there a message in that, or is it just meaningless? Like, but for me, it it, it it's a message, and it's almost like the rays of the sun on a flower. Yeah. It draws the best out of me. Yeah. So I mean, but now, uh, what Saint Thomas Aquinas said about that is, he said the people who want to take that path, very few of them will get there. It'll take them many years. Yeah. And there'll be so many detours and mistakes made along the way in yeah. terms of reasoning that it's a very difficult path and yeah. not many are going to get there. Yeah. And, I, and I believe he only got there towards the end of his life himself. Yeah. So, um, well, the, the transcendent God that we we're talking about didn't kind of kick the thing into motion and say, that's it, I'm finished with them, I'm yeah. going watching TV now. Yeah, yeah. Like, he, he's intimately involved in his, in his creation and to me, he's the one who's, uh, imminently drawing the good and drawing everything towards its its mm. proper finality or purpose mm. but uh he, he didn't leave the world in the fallen state that it that we know it's in yeah you know you only look around now and you see uh like whoever made this thing we can blame him and say this is pretty yeah. it's pretty shoddy workmanship but yeah. he actually entered into he wasn't the one who broke it yeah but he entered into the to, to, to the fix-up job yeah and 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 called out a relationship 
with us. Yeah. So like if you want to kind of, you're saying, okay, how can I get to know this transcendent being? Uh, if you're on the fence and you're agnostic and you say, that sounds interesting, it, it, it mm. tweaks my interest. Well, th- there are lots of people and uh, who, who claim to have encountered God or yeah. are, are part of a tradition yeah. uh, that claim to have encountered God. Like So we look back to, to the, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Mm. And uh, actually, so um, maybe if, if you have anything to respond to there, because my next thing then is, the, the next thing that's in my head, and I can go straight on to it if you want, yeah. but if there's anything that strikes you, uh, Edith Stein in, yeah. in her book, it's a really lovely thing anyway. Uh, so she was reflecting on uh, on the type of existence that we have and how fragile it is and, mm. and how, uh, as you said, like the last couple of minutes are gone and we'll never get them back again. We're here now. We haven't a clue what's down the line in a couple of, couple of hours time don't know mm. what's going to happen mm. how, how our world could change or so we're really this fragile yeah. uh, existence that lives on the present moment and she was um talking about the, the 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 fact is we still exist and even though we only exist from moment to moment and we're sustained by food and by by love and by interactions and stuff that that's how we grow she says we exist and it's a solid existence in the present moment mm. but it can give us a, a hint of a, of a of a an existence that's 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 much more pure and not so dependent on on past and future a pure existence of the eternal now yeah. which is what what I mean when I think of the transcendent god because our existence is not a pure existence we're mm. not all we can be yeah. in 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 one active being yeah. but that's what god is but she went on then uh, so so she said moses encountered god at the burning bush that's in exodus 3:14 and uh, uh, he said, I have to go to the Israelites and say, I've encountered you. So what is your name? And the name that God gave in Hebrew, which is a holy name for the, for, for the Jews, uh, he, he basically said, I am. I mm. am who I am. Mm. But I think we can sum it up as I am. Mm. Basically, I exist. Yeah. And, and I exist without qualification. Yeah. I am perfectly, eternally now yeah. and, and everywhere and always. Yeah. OK, so that's that's something. Com- so when I say I exist and I say God exists and God exists, analogy takes over there. Yeah. There's something similar. Yeah. The fact that we live and exist, but God's existence is so much greater and transcends that so much. So Edith Stein knew this is heavy stuff. Yeah. But she said also this, what God went on to say in one of the next lines, he said, I'm also the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, your your ancestors, the one that, that talked to them. So it's oh. me who's talking to you too. So it's a guy who walked in relationship with your yeah. ancestors yeah. Is, 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 is addressing you now. So go yeah. back and tell them that, that it's, 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 it's the Lord uh, that, that minded Abraham and that minded Isaac and Jacob and he's going to bring you from slavery. And I think to me that's, that moves from some theoretical idea to, to a personal relationship. And that's a lot more like the God I believe in, you know, yeah. the one that says, uh, I'm, I'm with you and I'm watching over you. And I watched over your father and mother and their ancestors. I watched over the people of Ireland back through the years. And, mm-hmm. and, and I'm with you now as well for, you, for your part of the journey, uh, a journey which is bringing you cl- closer to me and back to me. Yeah. And uh, so, like, th- I think that's why I'm just really profoundly yeah. moved by this idea of transcendence because... It, it's fascinating. Like, even as, as, I'm, uh, as I'm listening to there, I'm like wow like it, it's it, it's mind-boggling because what strikes me is like in today's in today's world we don't necessarily or we're not we're not great necessarily anymore maybe because it's just the busyness of life how much technology takes uh takes over our minds and our lives and everything and look i'm i'm, I'm the biggest culprit there but like these are these are these are fundamental questions that that you know that we need to be that we need to be exploring that we need to be uh that we need to be asking to um you, you know it's just absolutely mind-boggling just even the idea of this god that exists uh outside of outside of time outside of of everything and yet uh if if we if, if we were the only people that ever like if, if i was the only person or you were the only person that ever existed uh in this life um, you know, like God is still would have come and, and died for you because he that love that love we just can't even comprehend that love we can't even and even it's uh 
you know, so I, 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 I was, we were just trying to, I was teaching my, my goddaughter there recently and we were saying, well, you know, she was talking about when her parents say uh, to each other, they love each other. And you're saying, so they said, they, that, that's the most, these are the most important people in your life. But then we were talking about, well, how, well, actually in our life, God needs to be number one. And then our spouse, our husband and wife, number two, children three and everything else after that. And then they're saying, well, if you're getting married, if you're married to someone, should it be number one? And you're saying, well, no, because if I'm if I'm to love that person with with with, with, with my full ability, I need to love God first. I need to have God first because it's only by loving God first I can love this person uh, greater than I ever could have done without God. Um, and you could see just the just the look, the blank look in the face, going, that doesn't sound right. Uh, the, the, she, she was looking at me because she, she's she's a young little girl and she's that doesn't sound right and even that was only something that that I was only a, 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 coming to grasp with in previous years and you're like wow and that's only a small little thing now when you're listening to what you're saying today I'm like you're like wow it is fascinating it is absolutely fascinating yeah yeah and uh like I felt the exact same way yeah even when, like when I was 12 or 11 or 12 and someone is saying maybe the teacher was saying in school or I heard it in a sermon like uh, um, love God first and mom and dad are second and I'm yeah. like no yeah. mom and dad are first yeah, that's and it. uh, it's taken a huge amount to kind yeah. of say uh, actually God is first yeah. and that in no way subtracts from mom and dad as you yeah. say it actually uh, yeah. I don't know it it, it uh, vivifies or it, it puts yeah. the soul into the love that yeah. you have for other people yeah. uh, when you seek first the kingdom of God the rest is added on yeah. and um, and then to, to talk about the questions as well because I think, I think you mentioned mm. that like uh, Father Giussani has this tremendous book if anybody gets a chance to read it uh, yeah. The Religious Sense yeah. and he says I, I, I'll put that at the uh, at the bottom yeah. of the description box in yeah the so it, yeah. Is a, it was a, a game changer for me but uh, he talks about like that if you do you want to access the depth of your humanity, you've got to ask yourself the fundamental questions. And as you talked as well there, Brian, about the hecticness of life and going for mm. and the the social media and everything, uh, it actually kind of blocks us off from asking the fundamental questions of our existence. Yeah. And uh, we can have a moral sense and we can have a, a kind of an intellectual sense, but the religious sense comes from uh, asking the fundamentals: Where did I come from? Uh, where is my life headed? What does it mean to be to be a good person? Uh, what's what? What is this problem of evil that we all uh, encounter? Uh, beauty. Why does beauty move me so much? And why why do I find myself reacting to to saints who have done such inspirational things? And it's those questions that access something deeper in us yeah. uh, and and bring us alive in a new way. And it actually overflows into all the other aspects of our life. Then that's what I found. Like from from the the deeper encounter with my faith everything else uh, including hurling mm. was much more enjoyable and engaging mm. because there was there was a deeper spirit in it it's like yeah. you, you talk about like love being so important how do you love your spouse well for us the spirit of unity is the holy spirit yeah and like a spirit that's alive in your spouse's heart and in yours and then in the in your engagements and you begin to live in each other as the way Jesus says, I want to, mm. my, my father and I will come to you and make our home in you. Yeah. And it's the Holy Spirit that does that for us and makes our life so much yeah. richer. Yeah. It's just even when you go on about, uh, when you were talking there about, you know, even for people starting out to even one, one avenue is the question where it all come from. And like, when you think of like, you know, when, when, you, when we were beginning in the seminary and, and, and you begin studying philosophy um, and you're, you know, one of the things we're we're doing is you're, you're you're questioning where everything everything had to have a had to have a beginning, had the creator, and he all the way back, all the way back, all the way back. And as some friends of ours, and we've had this, this uh, conversation, friends of ours at home would have said, uh, once you get to this thing, where they as they say the Big Bang theory, they're like, oh, gotcha you now, and you're saying, well, actually, the Catholic Church agrees with the Big Bang theory, but that wasn't the, that wasn't the be all and in all that created there was a there was something that that triggered the big bang theory now go just go that extra step and you and, and and keep going back and once you once you're questioning like that like it's it's amazing like you 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 are going to there has to have been somewhere where i, I can't even i can't even put it into proper words now but when you're when just when you're listening to this 
you're going you're b- going back and questioning you're like gosh that's all coming together now when you think of this transcendent god and that it's it's it's, it's mind-boggling yeah exactly and uh i think it was a catholic priest who yeah. who, who george lemaitre who came that's up right. with the with the te- one of the theories of the big bang and, and yeah. worked it out with, with like and he was working with einstein and people like that that's right. and um and and I'm no expert in this, so I mean, maybe we shouldn't even be be going there too much. But like space and time, uh, in the in in the way that we know them, came into existence with the Big Bang. Yeah. Um. But anyway, look, that's for that's for brighter minds than us. <laughs> but even now, right? Um, like being moved towards goodness. Yeah. Um. Or or wanting to do a good act, right? That 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 pre um i presupposes the existence of goodness mm. so you think you're doing something good like uh, if you help somebody who's after falling or but uh, like the idea of goodness itself must be somewhere now i'm that, that's kind of a, a, a platonic take on things but like uh who's to say what is good or what isn't is it's just something that we kind of invent ourselves to suit our own cultural yeah. um mindset or is there um, a kind of a standard by which yeah. you know across all cultures yeah. uh, deliberate cold-blooded murder yeah. across all cultures is known to be bad yeah. and like an origin for 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 a very like like th- there are m- many differences between different cultures in, in certain things but there are certain fundamentals like that uh, like respect for for the integrity of of, yeah. of, uh, of the of each person and like they're all enshrined in in the UN uh, Charter of Human yeah. Rights uh, after the after the Second World War, all the basic ones, and I know it's a, it's a minefield now when you get into yeah. more, um, I suppose nitty gritty things. But but uh, like t- to say there's no goodness, yeah. I, I think uh, somebody who says that now needs to be walking around with a yeah. with, with with a cloth over their eyes and yeah. and over their heart maybe yeah. as well, because yeah. there really is so much goodness, just yeah. as there is so much evil, and and it, it causes a question for yeah. us uh, in terms of origin, in terms of inspiration for our yeah. own acts. Yeah. So, so like even yeah. So I, I guess what you're, you know, when you're talking there about, um, you know, the example of goodness. I guess we're talking even, you know, there about. So the whole problem as well. We're touching it, I guess, of relativism. Whereas you know, you know what, what's what's good for me. Uh, there's there's something you know what I define as good. You can define good as something else, and it's whatever is good for you and good for me. But you know, in fact that. Like when it come when it comes to God, there is a, you know, there there's there's just a there's a sta- there's there's a goodness a standard goodness so to speak. I don't even want to use the term standard when it comes to God, but you know what I mean. Yeah. A standard uh, 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 goodness and, and like uh, you know and, and today in particularly uh, today's world we, we we're we're seeing we're experiencing the you know the whole the whole area of relativ- relativism. Uh, in such a massive, massive, massive way. So yeah, just just striking me there as I'm yeah. listening to you. And and um, I think part of this com- part of something that grows out of all that is the idea of rights without responsibilities yeah. or outside the context of responsibilities, where we're all going around, we're banging on the desk yeah. for our rights. Yeah. But like rights and responsibilities are are another twin pair. Yeah. And maybe I think even responsibility or our ability to do the right thing or the good thing in a yeah. situation is more fundamental. Than, yeah. than the rights we have yeah. um i'm not saying I, I don't know if that's fully correct but um but they're certainly twin and yeah. and, and, and I, maybe i shouldn't put one ahead of the other yeah. but um but what we have at the moment is an awful lot of hollering for rights uh and and i think if more people decided well actually i'm responsible mm. i should be the agent for the good in the situation mm. and not expecting the situation to be providing for me solely yeah. That um like that because that's a, a an offshoot of saying yeah. well what's good for you is good for me but but I want to demand my rights but uh, actually like uh, fate I think challenges people to say um what can I give to the situation yeah you know um rather than what can I extract yeah. from it I guess in a in a, in a very simple way uh, there like you know the idea of Mother Teresa comes to mind where she's like you know um you know when people are asking her like how do you how do you do what you do in Calcutta and it's like you know it's just one person at a time one poor person at a time you just do uh, you do what you can uh, to bring goodness into a situation one situation at a time uh, and that's so yeah that's a, that's kind of that, that, that was striking me there as you were as you're talking earlier on you mentioned St. Thomas Aquinas now I might put you in the spot here what exactly did St. Thomas Aquinas do you know say on the transcendence of God okay so um that's a good question 
and uh, I'm not sure to be honest. Yeah, no, that's so fair I, enough. I, I can sit here in Dominican. No, I caught you out in, that one because yeah, I, I know because I know we haven't uh, discussed what yeah. questions we're going to ask each other. Yeah. So yeah, but, I'm uh, catching you out here. Sorry. If, <laughs> if, if I if I venture to make a, an informed answer yeah. in Dominican headquarters, I think yeah. <laughs> I find myself yeah. out on the street very quick. Yeah. Now, you see, the 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 definition of God that that Bishop Robert Barron often uses yeah. is taken from um is taken from Saint Thomas, okay. and it's ipsum esse. Oh. existence yeah. okay so essay is to be so it's the su- subsistent active to be and it's basically what and Edith Stein um, uses that as well because she's like uh, making a dialogue between St. Yeah. Thomas and the old yeah. scholastic philosophy and her her uh, phenomenology so she she takes that up like this idea of a of a, a being that stands on itself that that that, that, um, that is uncontained and uh, so I'd say that's Kind of and and an interesting thing for Saint Thomas is, uh, which which um, I think uh, those outside the Catholic fold find a bit challenging, is uh, God is is very is pure sim- simplicity. He's simple, yeah. like he's not broken up into yeah. like we're mind and body, our body and soul, and we've so much dramas and splits and struggles in our life, mm. and we we find different pulls on us. God is just pure love yeah that 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 is his existence and he says it about himself in 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 the in our saint john says it about him god is love yeah okay which is the 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 decisive contribution i think of of um of christianity based on this encounter with jesus we're able to say god is love Mm. uh pure love and so somebody like who who's baptized and and confirmed and grows up in a in a Catholic environment, or even somebody who, who uh, for whatever reason God chooses and has an encounter, uh, gets some get, gets the, the experience of this love within, and um, it's it's very hard to put words on that. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, but that's that's um, yeah like that's a that, again to use a word a game changer for yeah. that's it because even like it, you say there like God is God is so simple and. You know, it's right me during the week in one of Father Patrick Cattle's homilies, he was talking about, you know, in order for us to become saints, sometimes people wonder, do we have to do these extraordinary things to, you know, save cities, save the world, try and come up with a, a, a cure for, for world hunger? When he said, you know, it's the simple things. If you have to uh, change the nappy of the, uh, of the child, offer it to God, that in itself can do miracles you know the small thing you're 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 scrubbing um i know before we were recording here uh you're we were talking about saint faustine and you were telling me the example of um the muddy floor and the you know scrub, scrub the end of thing and these small simple acts offered to god can like these things these these are the things when offered to god can get us to heaven and when you say that like, god is simple it just shows that even in the simplest of acts he can use that to, to, to make us into saints. So that's uh, that's fascinating. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So Father Vinny, we've been chatting for an hour and the time has just gone like that. Right. But it'll be absolutely fantastic to have you again another time. Absolutely. Because uh, be, uh, I know this is this is something that you can on your only can scrape the surface and you yeah. can go de- you can definitely go deeper in because it, it's a it's a fascinating it's a fascinating topic and it's a topic mm. that you kind of uh, even listen to. I know when I would be listening to that, we'd be listening to it a couple of times. Uh, and just even to you know, just try to get your head around yeah. it is, uh, and uh, I mean, as a because of a time constraint, constraint, the major mission that we have really is to talk about where does Jesus fit into this idea of the transcendence of God. Yeah. So I mean, that can be for another day. Yeah. But l- let's just say, like, I mean, that's where the real that's where the real money is. Yeah. Uh, looking at the the incarnation and yeah. and 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 the cross and yeah. No, that's fantastic. So we'll uh, look. We'll 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 keep that so for the. For the, for the next episode and uh, Father Vinny thank you so much for your time for, for coming down here to, to Cork because I know you've uh, as a day awesome priest it's a, you have a hectic set schedule so for taking the time to come down here to Cork and just to thank again the, the Dominicans here in St Mary's and Pope's Key in Cork for allowing us to use their students especially to, to, to Father Luke um, and just as we finish Father Vinny would you mind leading us in a closing prayer I will and, and maybe just one comment and yeah. it goes back to, to, to the very start when we were talking I was saying about you know chatting with the kids about God yeah, yeah. and I think like to actually sit down and have a chat with someone about yeah. matters of faith yeah. and, and, and about even even about matters of philosophy so you don't yeah. have to be like 
a gung ho believer. Yeah. You're kind of interested in these questions, and it really you're 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 with somebody who's a friend of yours. Yeah. When you can sit down then and open up what's on your heart and what's in your mind, and not feel like you're going to be ridiculed because you don't think the same way as the other person yeah. or something, yeah. and that you get to these deep questions. I, I genuinely and and you kind of alluded to it as well. It, it brings your humanity out. So yeah. so maybe yeah. we'll kind of include that now in our exactly. in our prayer as we exactly. as we finish. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, Father in heaven, uh, as we turn to you now, uh, it's our faith and you have revealed to us that, that you made us out of the depths of your infinite love and that uh, each day you sustain and provide with love uh, for, for your creatures and you're calling us uh, not to, to stay in this life but to, uh, to consummate that love in the kingdom of heaven. So I ask you to bless each one of us, bless all who, who, who listen, Lord, in their hearts and uh, uh, inspire and, and, and draw the best out of their, their humanity because uh, cause our hearts are restless, Lord. They're restless because they're made for you and uh, until they rest in you, uh, they, they'll fi- they won't will find what they were made for. So you ask uh, uh, your blessing, God, on, on everyone who hears this, on all our listeners, listeners and uh, we entrust them to you now. Uh, we, we entrust them to your son, Jesus Christ, and to the spirit of his love. So, so we ask God's blessing on each one of you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks a million, Father Vinny. No bother at all. Brother. God bless.